Hello, and welcome to the Books Uncovered podcast, a podcast brought to you by Fulcrum Publishing, where we explore the world of books and the people who make up the publishing and the book industry. I'm Sam Shinta, Fulcrum's publisher, and I am joined by my co-host, Kateri Kramer, Fulcrum's marketing director. Hi, Kateri. How are you today? I'm great. I've got my uh, third cup of coffee today. Uh, oh, excellent. <laughs> I'm good. I'm, I'm guessing you're probably extra great today because yeah. your nuggets... Your nuggets won last night, and uh, yeah. one for the one for the record books too. The first oh, triple yeah. double in uh, NBA teammates. finals. Yeah, yeah, that's just remarkable. So, yeah, uh, yeah it's uh, I, it, they they're looking pretty unstoppable at this point. They I are. think you're going to have a parade here coming up. In I Denver didn't say that soon. the last game. But I found yes. that so we'll see. We'll see how I feel on Friday. <laughs> you know, there there can be little hiccups along the way. Yeah. We're good. Well, we're we're all. Uh, because uh, especially out here in the Midwest, we really don't like Miami because of what they yeah. did to our beloved Bucks. We are really right. cheering for the Nuggets to take them down. Good. Well, we have a <laughs> we have a wonderful, wonderful guest today. Someone I've known for a number of years, a, a wonderful author, thinker, activist, Jose Barrero. Jose is scholar emeritus at the Smithsonian Institution. He retired as a research and program director at the National Museum of the American Indian. He is a novelist essayist and activist of nearly four decades on American indigenous hemispheric themes. Barrero is a member of the Taino Nation of the Antilles. Welcome, Jose Barrero. How are you today? Good. Thank you for this. Nice well, it's great to see you as always. Uh, and uh, I, I'm thinking that the first time you and I met was uh, when you were at Indian Country Today, and we met at the second annual uh, uh, recognition for uh, lifetime achievement, which was given to Vine Deloria, and I think out of that we did a, a book on uh, American is America is Indian Country, which was selected columns from Indian Country Today, and uh, since then you've done another beautiful book for us, uh, Taina, which we'll talk about here. Uh, so uh, tell us a little bit about the. You, you, I mentioned in that in that intro, you work on these hemispheric themes. What what do you what does that mean for for listeners who are not familiar with this in terms of the context of indigenous work? Uh, the hemispheric context that emerges for um, the communications movement, the traditional movement of indigenous peoples, uh, is um, uh, really uh, follows um, a, a movement to go to the United Nations from the 1960s and 70s, especially, uh, and to uh, clear some obstacles to that communication to come directly from indigenous communities. And so that that um, context of uh, an indigenous voice, which is not one voice, but it's uh, many voices in, in, in a context of some messaging that does converge, but it's uh, many voices from many places. Uh, in, indigenous to place uh, in the Americas, you know, American indigenous, American Indian, uh, uh, originario, uh, different terms for describing the populations of of rootedness in the Americas prior to uh, the contact uh, with Europe. And it goes to that, but it also goes to common thinking. Uh, a thread of a conversation that emerges from those times when indigenous people were able to travel more and uh, overcome the remoteness of place and communications. And uh, so a time when even telephones were unavailable uh, altogether, you know, so um, to, to have that conversation uh, from the base communities and then take it to a larger arena with the idea that there is a thinking, that, the, that there is something to be said uh, and that uh, it doesn't represent perfect peoples. It just represents a thinking of humankind that hasn't been taken into account. <clears throat> and this is, this is the work that emerges, you know, from that uh, the prevailing, always the prevailing idea about indigenous people has been the expectation of extinction. It's going to disappear. 
uh, even the anthropology, of course, archaeology looks the past uh, fully, but uh, uh, anthropology, especially the disciplines that look at indigenous people, always with this idea of disappearance. And somewhere around mid-century, 20th century, it, it uh, gestalt happened among many peoples of many places, those nooks and crannies of indigeneity uh, of the need for survival, the quest for survival, to look mm -hmm. at the consciousness of how the new science being the science of survival, not just the study of threats of extinction. And so that shift was very fundamental uh, ac across the hemisphere. And that began a dialogue that we all were part of in some way or another. I, I, uh, I was myself looking at that time, like many of us in, in the Taino world, looking at how to reconvene, how to uh, reconnect uh, to the, that ancestral uh, link. Uh, and uh, uh, in, in various ways, everybody looking for that. And so that was part of that movement, but that was something that you could see in many parts of the hemisphere and in many communities. Uh, among the Maya, it was a revitalization movement. Among the Haudenosaunee, or uh, uh, myself, I, I live specifically with, in the Mohawk community here, but I, you saw a movement of that, of uh, uh, more uh, strength of recovery of language, protection of life ways, um, attention to the teachings, the elder teachings that were still there, uh, especially we're talking late 60s, early 70s, at least, at least when I began to move in these, uh, in, in, in these uh, movement circles, um, the, uh, the, the voices were very, uh, really the old timers that came came of age in the 1910s you know in, in in the early 1900s even even the earlier century so there were uh very transitional knowledge generational knowledge that uh was very precious to hear so that that was the privilege you know to hear uh from the cultures themselves now mm -hmm. we've still the necessary filtering of all that through academia. So we have a lot of young native intellectuals dealing with the knowledge, you know, bringing that knowledge forward into an academic context and so forth. And it's that has its positive nature, but I, I'm just very, I'm nostalgic still for how those old timers created a language uh, a connective language and uh, and an impetus, you know, the the the, um, the more than a permission, almost like a go get it, you know, for the young people, get your culture back, get it, you know, get it. It's difficult. It's a it's a turnover puzzle. It's been run over twenty times by many forces, economic and religious and. Uh, political, um, of course, through armies and so forth, but somehow it's resilient. And so you have that connective tissue and people rebuild those, using new materials, but rebuild uh, a, a consciousness, uh, um, common identity, uh, uh, shared values and knowledge. Uh, uh, in, in, in many, many places, thankfully, shared space, still uh, a geographic place to crucial land, land bases, crucial uh, for indigeneity to, to thrive. Uh, but the continuity through the families, the continuity through the societies, uh, there's, you know, whether spiritual societies or mutual help groups in the communities, uh, it's all part of that, that uh, uh, culture of belonging in the community, uh, which, uh, you know, you see disappearing throughout the world, uh, uh, just many forces that, uh, uh, and it's at the same time, it's the basis of survival generally, to know to know your environment, you know, to know to know where your water comes from, mm -hmm. and, and 
gets to you <laughs> is crucial uh kind of knowledge that people often just take for granted and um so i i i was very privileged sam to to uh by just by coincidence or or by uh, guidance uh to meet some of the early personalities in the movement that were really doing some serious thinking as well as activism militancy even uh interesting to see this uh a nation professor types when they were militants <laughs> you know <laughs> on the street and later transitioned to nice uh lecturing <laughs> podiums but uh uh, and, and to meet the folks that uh, were in it, uh, that meant that you, you mentioned uh, uh, Oren Lyons, uh, uh, our, our, our good friend, John Mohawk, uh, Sajitsuwa, uh, uh, the clan mother leaders of the time, like Audrey uh, Shenandoah, uh, Judy Swamp over here, Akosasni, others, uh, many chiefs really who, um, um unbeknownst to most of America were still there, you know, were doing doing do, do, doing what they could to to give voice. So it was uh it was a uh a formative time and um I was glad to be part of it and and when the uh when the Taino consciousness movement uh began to find its its footing uh and really finding the the base community places and the base families that had sustained uh pieces of 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 uh, knowledge and identity um it I, I i was happy to have had that other experience with the uh, uh tribal bases uh nation bases like the Haudenosaunee like the Lakota you know uh northern northern peoples uh, uh that i got to know uh and and uh to learn from elders that that uh um from which i can I, I, you could kind of learn to how to perceive the world and uh and see it among our own people see it uh in, in especially my own folks in in cuba uh, where i'm from uh in the mountains uh, especially of the, the, the eastern mountains of cuba even, even to the plains with with my my own uh, people there too but um a substantial amount of 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 of, of culture and identity and and belonging uh that uh uh many many people walking by looking for uh, Indians in Cuba, uh, not finding people in loincloths jumping out of trees. <laughs> uh, this is, wasn't of interest, you know, but mm -hmm. they had to take their time with the folks and really, you know, uh, see what was in the, in the mind. Uh, so um, I, I, I think all that comes together, Sam, as part of my own experience, uh, uh, what I try to put into the work I do. Well, and that's you know, it's it's fascinating. You you mentioned you you had that phrase in there about you know we're all still here, and and I think over the past fifty years that's been the transformation of of indigenous cultures in the world. This whole idea of moving. I, I remember when I was a kid, the idea was well, uh, Indians are in the museum, right? That's 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 where you go to see native peoples. And now it's no, they are thriving. And, and so to have been part of this bringing of all this, these cultures together and raising the consciousness uh, worldwide, not just here in the Western hemisphere, but worldwide on the fact that indigenous people certainly are part of the heritage of this earth, but are also part of the present and very much integral part of the future of this earth. Uh, and culminating, of course, in that, you know, the 2007 declaration from the United Nations uh, on indigenous peoples, um, that it's, it's just a remarkable transformation. So the, the fact that you were able to be a part of that is, is it, to me all, all the more remarkable. Uh, it, it seems so to me as well, uh, as I enter my, uh, what, what, what a cousin of mine reminded me yesterday, 
entering our fourth age. Uh, uh, the third age, I guess, was 50 to 75. And where you see me here, <laughs> entering my fourth age, uh, to look back and see, um, be able to see the thread over, over that kind of time. Uh, I was just thinking, I wanted to show you guys. This is, a, this is an issue of the magazine from Cornell University that we did through the 90s, um, Native Americas. And this one, this issue was celebrating the 25 years since Wounded Knee, mm, 73. Mm -hmm. And it was really ancient, almost ancient history at 25. Yeah. <laughs> and this year we celebrated the 50th year, you know, mm -hmm. <laughs> since Wounded Knee. So uh, it's amazing because when I was growing up to think back 50 years was a long time. You're talking like World War One, you know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and now to think, uh, uh, for me to think 50 years, and my wife, we were talking, my wife, Gudgie, and she was one of those uh, active a activists at the time and took a took a car out to uh, Pine Ridge, South Dakota during Wounded Knee in 73. And that whole car got arrested. They got handcuffed and put in a hmm. street and so forth. So she had her experiences. That's 50 years ago, you know, it's like. Uh, wow, you know, it's like talking civil war. But, um, <laughs> big changes, you know, we've seen big changes, really, from that process of extinction. Mm -hmm. it's reached into the 1950s in, in, in North America with, with the termination era. This, you know, completely wipe mm -hmm. out the idea of tribal bases in the federal law and everywhere. Lose, lose everybody off. In, uh, uh, in into the American system without any previous notion of rights or property, um, uh, you know, continuation of that. So that's 1950s when Vine Deloria and others were beginning to cut their teeth and emerge in that late 50s, early 60s, uh, 61, uh, National Congress of American Indians begins to form, uh, big deal. Uh, organization in, in, the, in, the, in the system, you know, uh, but by mid 60s, in the 60s too, you had the, uh, in the same time, the, 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 the academic, uh, political, lawyerly Indian class, native class, uh, people are dealing with the, with the rights area. Uh, the old timers are driving around in old cars, meeting each other. This is, this is, they'll tell you this, the oral history is, of the long hairs that went around in the late 50s, early 60s, uh, in old trucks, you know, going around meeting the other long hairs, the other old timers in the different reservations. And, and that was a crucial dialogue that a young, a young Oran Lyons cut his teeth on and mm -hmm. others, 17, 15 years old. So that history comes forward uh, from a very grassroots orientation from the old timers, uh, as well as then the, again, the more political minded folks who want to organize on that level, took it nationally and the lawyers and the fighting, the fighting at that point, uh, termination, and they beat it back here and there, you know, it got, it, 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 it uh, did a lot of damage in some tribes, but it, it got beaten back as a policy, and that that was a role. And but th that old timers dialogue, that's what went into the longhouses, the kivas, the the TP meetings. Uh, you know that that was formulating at the same time all, all that. Uh, and and the early activist groups that I ran with, they were emerging from that very active grassroots. No no. No government or foundation grants to be had, you know. Nobody was <laughs> thinking that way yet, you know. Nobody knew what that was so much. Just people put the pennies together, load, you know, put the gas in the car, and, and you're gonna get fed among, along the way and stay in wherever. And that's how that things got done. So it was it, it seeing that go through the stages of uh, NCI coming together, then. Uh, the Haudenosaunee uh, fights here over border rights in the mm -hmm. 1960s and 1969, uh, 
a big uh, uh, fight here that uh, uh, from which comes Akwasasni Notes, the national Indian newspaper of the movement, it began to be published here. That gathered a bunch of people, including myself. That's how I found my way to Akwasasni was writing on movement things out in Minneapolis, St. Paul, uh, and the uh, notes picking up my articles and then inviting me to go with them on a relief mission to Guatemala in 1976. Another world to run down to Guatemala from the longhouse, the traditional longhouse at Akwasasni on a school bus and an old motor home and a bunch of uh, uh, nurses and herbalists and uh, uh, construction guys and uh, all the way through Mexico into Guatemala to Cachiquel uh, country in, in, in the mountains of Guatemala. And I was doing something else and they needed somebody that could speak Spanish so that they invited me to, to come along <laughs> and write it up. But uh, 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 that was grassroots. That was grassroots impetus. They had met the the Guatemalan Maya folks the year before, and then this big earthquake happened and tragedies galore, many dead, and just they decided to send a group down. And that's that. So that was a whole experience right through this kind of work of movement because alliances came out of all that movement that later found themselves to the UN, United Nations process, to uh, human rights campaigns and <clears throat> uh, uh, how people get some strength in the world by, by identifying their, their common interests. So uh, that, that work, when I came back from that, well, that was Akosasi Notes time and John Mohawk was there that's where I met him. Uh, uh, always, uh, always a force, John. You know, intellectual. Mm -hmm. Always could move things because his thinking, even though he became a doctorate and a major uh, histo uh, history professor, what have you, but his thinking was rooted in the longhouse. It was he was uh, brought up in the longhouse. He never knew inside of a church. He never knew the uh, anything else. But uh, listening to the elders and the songs and the cycles and the uh, ceremonial cycles uh, over the year with, with the longhouse, the language, the gardens. He grew up in that uh, agricultural base that was still very strong in the 50s and 60s, uh, and, it, and it's becoming so again, uh, uh, of the old gardens, uh, community gardens. Uh, so uh, the, the intellectual base was very, um, very well rooted, uh, and, and people could listen to it. You know, uh, folks that never read a book, you know, could, could listen to John, even though he sometimes he talked way way over everybody's heads but uh, on the other hand uh you could listen to him you could tell he was he was from the base you know uh like that uh sam many things that um uh, created an indigenous movement uh i uh i think for for to talk a little bit about the book uh, uh taino uh it, 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 it comes out of that quest you know to to build uh, to build that connection for our own folks that uh, uh, didn't have a, that, that access to it, and um, by uh, again by, by by hook by crook or coincidence or or uh, uh, more intelligence than that, but uh, um, it came as a fiction, you know, as a as a book that way, and and and. Uh, I was glad to uh, I was glad to uh, be able to do it at the time I did. It was uh, it was quite the year for us. That's 1992, 93. Um, also a big year because that was the uh, coincided with the 500th anniversary of, of the uh, Columbus uh, voyage and. 
uh, a, a, an event that uh, even though it was intended to be a big celebration it gave a very strong impetus to the native movement of the americas very strong impetus just everybody you know it just converged everybody and lots of uh again new new consciousness that has continued since since then uh in in this whole uh anti-columbus movement and so forth which you know I'm, uh, from my vantage point i get a little tired of sometimes uh, you know uh, oh, oh columbus uh, <laughs> I almost feel sorry for the guy sometimes, you know, it's gotten, <laughs> gotten beat up so bad. <laughs> and not much left to him. He's been flayed. And, <laughs> but uh, uh well, what's remarkable with what you yeah. did with Taino is in instead of taking on Columbus head on, right? You just flip the story. <clears throat> Who are these these people? <laughs> right. Mm -hmm. So it's it's just it's it's kind of flipping the narrative that we don't know, uh, as opposed to hammering the story that we all have learned, it's like, well, no, let's recognize there were other people here <laughs> and, yeah. and their story matters as well. Yeah. Yeah. And, and the, the good, the nice thing about putting in what, what we call fiction is, is, uh, cause it's kind of like a dream to me. Fiction writing is, is very different. Uh, is, um, is, is you can keep the human nuance on things, mm -hmm. you know, uh it's it's not it's not like asking uh, who do we hate now you know <laughs> it's more looking at what what happened and what human beings act like within those forces um so i i uh, I, was I was telling my wife recently that i i, I really wish i would have kept on writing uh on along those lines i i just i didn't have the the financial backup to to do that in my life uh, uh and other things call my uh my work but but um it's i enjoyed not too it late to start again well i have a couple of things in the works you know i just <laughs> uh my problem now i have 40 years of research all laid out you know and i want to do it all <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> well you know there's probably a fifth and a sixth age you know if you keep yeah. if you keep going so <laughs> well that's that's just quite remarkable this whole idea that that all of these i mean i i when i talk with different authors it's always fun to hear how they come to the the, the point of the thing they're working on or that they writ they wrote uh but for you this is all integral to the activism right and the raising of consciousness it all is a, of a piece uh, and so even, even a fiction, even a novel is tied in with that activism, uh, which is, which is just wonderful. And, and what I, I love about what you're describing here is you're, you're describing both a raising of individual tribal slash nation consciousness, but then this idea that these nations are also working together. These, these different groups are working together to raise consciousness as a whole. Uh, and and it's rare that you see something like that, where you where you see groups both trying to assert their own uh, history and and Im continued impact on the culture, but then also recognizing. And I love that when you were talking about you know the long hair is going from <laughs> all across the country and sharing the oral history and in building those relationships that it's we're, well we're all doing this independently but we all have to do this together as well yeah well yes and and i, I think um that mutual recognition uh uh the old uh, our old cacique in cuba panchito with, with whom i also did a book uh that was published in cuba he said uh indio busca indio uh, indian looks for indian and no. uh india busca indio, busca indio. And and uh, uh, and and so while all that was happening, um, it met up with, um, you know, the sharing of that history of oppression, that history mm -hmm. of problems, you know, uh, and um, uh, in a in a moment when uh, once again, as there's just waves of economic 
projects that impact Indian country in some way or another, whether they're huge energy projects or initially huge farm projects or whatever is there to take over Indian lands as an economic force. Uh, and uh, that that also uh, engendered a lot of human rights situations, violations, killings of leadership. Uh, mm -hmm. Places it turned into massacre of whole villages one after another, you know, just because they were Indian villages, native villages. So it, it was a tough time, and as it still is, uh, because that onslaught just doesn't end. And so wherever people have a sense that they want to be part of their territories in a different way, and this is not to, again, as, as the elders pointed out in Geneva back in 77, and I want to get to Geneva in a moment, but uh, we're not representing perfect peoples, but we're representing a way of thinking and the way of life that really merits attention and mer it merits, you know, uh, I mean, you saw that um, in the sense of... Um, uh, kind of a thinking that uh, epitomized uh, uh, a generation now, uh, when when in Geneva or in Lyons, you know, was given that that task. I remember being there again. I was uh, <laughs> my friend Tim Johnson uh, calls me the the Forrest Gump of the Indian movement. <laughs> 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 but, but somehow I end up in the room where something's happening and later on it really turns out to have been a real serious thing to have been in you know so in Geneva I was all over translating for the elders uh throughout the official translators and had me doing everything for four days uh but uh we were able to um uh see see the the um well put together elders you know that went there went to geneva and uh so it 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 went from being a um a uh a, a telling of the of just the um horrible abuses uh to uh a discussion of who we were that was that 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 fell to a, a chief of the of the uh, Seneca's uh, Corbett Sundown, who was there, elder. When one of the lawyers made a big uh, a big case for uh, defining the unity of the native peoples as being based on the history of common oppression, the common history of oppression, and this was this was okay. It was acceptable to people. And then Corbett got up and said, no, that's what happened to us. That's not who we are. Mm. Come tomorrow morning to my tobacco burning Thanksgiving address. I'm going to do first thing in the morning, and you'll see what I'm talking about. And sure enough, he did that at Geneva in 1977. Again, the first time that a combined native voice arrived at an international arena without having been chosen by government but having chosen itself to to get there uh and uh he he burned he burned tobacco which is the sacrament again one of those things of unifying conceptually unifying and spiritually unifying is the use of tobacco as a as the most overwhelming of the sacraments in the Americas that come uh, that assist native ceremony and is a crucial part of, of native ceremony. So um, many recognize themselves in it. And then he uh, uh, went through the Thanksgiving address of, of the appreciation of the human being for being alive, for for, for the earth, for the grasses, for the trees, for the birds, for you know, the winged, all the way to the to the cosmic family, you know, son and the father, son, and grandmother, moon, etc. But uh, even though places have different ways of expressing these thoughts, uh, very foundational sentiments, they are expressed 
in 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 ceremony and just about I, I i've been privileged to be invited to a range of ceremonies in the native world never seen a ceremony that didn't have at its core appreciation mm. for just being alive in this wonderful creation you know and that's like at its core whatever else wherever else it goes that's the core you cannot go without that and so talk about unity of mind it's not marxist leninist tomes of ideology it's not you know uh uh, it's not uh, free market tomes of ideology. It's, it's, but it is an ideology. It is an idea, you know, and it, 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 it carries, and it was brought forth in the mid nineteen seventies into that arena by imperfect people from imperfect peoples, you know. But nevertheless, there it was it landed and. It was recognizable and it sustained from that point that 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 led to that uh, declaration of rights that led to the permanent forum in New York uh, every spring, which has brought a lot of things together. People, again, have been able to bring many delegations. My own Taino, I'm very proud of them because many people are in New York. Many of people who have come through the Taino movement uh, have been relinking back to the islands, but they're also in New York. And so a lot of these delegations from South America and other parts of the world have needed places to stay in New York. These delegations don't arrive with large budgets. And the Taino folks in New York have played a nice, strong role in facilitating these meetings. So that's a quiet way, family to family, people have met later on, there's travel, you know, there's other forms of helping each other. Um, but, uh, and 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 uh, some of our folks have actually sustained into that work. I think of Mucaro, uh, uh, Roberto Borrero, who um, presided over the permanent forum in New York for number of years and still very involved in it uh and other folks like that so uh it's been uh uh, uh it's been a powerful thing in, in in my work in cuba with uh, cacique panchito and that's a whole that's a whole topic in itself but um one of the clever things we did was not just try to create events with academics but to always bring a delegation of native people from different places because panchito and 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 the native folks is indio busca indio you know they they hit it off and and so all the denial of extinction couldn't it just didn't work you know people the academics that came with that idea saw what they saw and uh so sometimes uh, you know you have to convince people in different ways as as well as of course all the research and so forth uh so it's it's uh it's been part and parcel one thing with the other and many movements many people you know uh over the years up and down of of uh of this international work and now the um the knowledge that was brought by Corbett Sundown into the, you know, with the Thanksgiving address, the, the principles of that, um, that has carried so that there's a lot of people for whom the indigenous concept, indigeneity, is, uh, is, uh, is a new framework of how to think about, about the human condition and who we are and where we go from here. And, what becomes reasonable principles to sustain and on and on, you know, practice and principles. Um, so in, in that context, I think uh, the indigenous emergence in, 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 in generality, again, because I'm, I'm, I'm loath of, uh, I, don't, I don't always trust charismatic leaders or anything that has that kind of, <laughs> you know, that kind of dictum, you know, 
uh, it's, it's many things. Uh, to, but on the other hand, uh, it epitomizes uh, 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 that the human being has a tradition of living more uh, humbly, more connected with the natural world forces in a in a context, in a in a spiritual context, in a context of values and knowledge. Uh, uh, so uh, people are very tired of the. Um, uh, the 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 large isms you know uh, uh, in the world uh, all of which seem to fail <laughs> at one point or another and uh, in the human the smaller human community um, uh, it's what I'm seeing right now in in, in Cuba uh, where there's a serious uh, uh, economic crisis right now and uh, food is scarce. Uh, that uh, the the human community that produces on the earth does better in times of crisis, and so that's that's a, a part of that message is how do you how do you do that how do you live more self sufficient life more ecosystem life ecosystemic life uh, so all of that fits in, in I think in that thinking and and uh, sure is sure is growing and. Our young people are graduating from the communities uh, at a very strong rate from colleges. Uh, young people are coming back to the community with very good training. Uh, so we're seeing uh, a, a lot of interest in the in the traditional knowledge as well. I'm a positivist, you know. <laughs> uh, uh, there are plenty of problems <laughs> in in communities. And uh, there's a lot of legacy of mystery, you know, a lot of legacy of, you know, from the residential schools to things that had real impacts on families and generations, uh, for, for generations. Uh, so, you're gonna, of course, there are many problems, but uh, it's, there's something that stands. Uh, it's, it's not a fantasy. It's not a, rom a romantic notion that human beings... Um, develop uh, ways of life based on these other principles you know uh, so I think that's a that's the contribution of indigenous at this real really crucial point you know and half in New York is choking today <laughs> so. yeah <laughs> well and that's you know so many of our authors talk about this very thing that not only you know the idea we're still here but we are integral to the future uh, of this of this nation. Uh, and and of the world that that you have to tap into indigenous knowledge and respect indigenous knowledge to be able to actually move forward. Um, the, you know, your book Taino is, just does such a wonderful job of pro providing the history, but also uh, getting us to look at history and the past differently, which also obviously then can reflect on our, how we look at the, the present. Um, and so our, our, uh, this is the, 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 the segment every time where we talk about book recommendations, uh, we thought we would go with this idea of uh, what, what Taino does, which is it really challenges the prevailing narrative of what, you know, Columbus's landing. And as I said before, just kind of tells the story that nobody knows, the, the story behind the story. Um, and, but I, I understand you've got a recommendation of a book that challenged the narrative that really ties into everything we've been talking about today. So why don't you talk a little bit about that, uh, about that book? Oh, and, and I, I uh, <laughs> can only find a very early copy of it. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> very humbly done. Because this is, um, uh, this is a very interesting little book, Basic Call to Consciousness, that really uh, is largely the work of John Mohawk, uh, Sojitsu, uh, uh, Seneca philosopher and, and, uh, activists uh and and uh and and came together uh, as a, a question uh, in that process that went to geneva in 1977 the 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 native nations that were going to present in geneva were asked to uh, provide three papers that had to do with uh uh the their history of oppression uh economically politically and spiritually and um, 
uh, the, uh, where we were working in those days was at a mountaintop in, in the Adirondacks where the offices of the Akosasi Nose were. Uh, <laughs> and uh, and the, the, visit, the, the chiefs and the clan mothers would visit up there to talk about this process that, of going to Geneva, which has many interesting anecdotes in it. But one of the, one of the uh, assignments was uh, to to present this history and different ones were presenting what, what the native world was about and what the Haudenosaunee were about. And this old chief from Akwesasne said, well, I understand how we are. What I don't know is what, what makes the white man the way he is. That's what I want to know. <laughs> so there's a interesting, you know, uh, way of thinking, thinking why, why, why is he, why, why didn't he stay in his own lands? Why is he do what he does to the land here? Why, you know, so forth. And what, what drives him? Uh, and uh, it fell to John to go on to do this methodical and, and, and very uh, refreshing take on Western civilization and the, the, the driving forces of Western civilization from the perspective of the native thinking, of the elders thinking. And there was a process where he would write a few pages and either go to Onondaga for the grand councils or the group of chiefs and clan mothers would come visit us at the, at the, at the Adirondack camp. But he would then go through the process of reading it to them and they would add and create ideas and ask questions. And he would go back and do his uh, <laughs> home research. But what emerges is a, it's a document that stands the test of time. And really, uh, unfortunately, we lost John early in his life. He had another 15 years to really, should have had another 15 years to produce really from this seminal thinking. But this is what the Six Nations, so the Nashoni took to Geneva in 77 to read there. And it later was compiled into this book. And I find it very significant and I'm, of course, very proud and, and that to have been able to participate somewhat in it. But the, the, uh, the idea that... Um, uh, that there is, and now there's many tomes about many presentations at the United Nations, but this uh, is, like John would like to say, uh, a look at the world, the hist history of civilization from, through Pleistocene eyes, through <laughs> old thinking and the old language thinking. So I, 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 I like it. I like the, the symbology of it and I like the, the message of it. Uh, it's, there's new editions that have come out on it, and um, Fulcrum helped me with this one, uh, which is was the effort to go around after John passed away in uh, 06 uh, to uh, go around and collect uh, pieces that he published in little magazines and here and there, and it was a, a bit of a detective chore, but putting down uh, some some pretty fine little essays uh, from his pen and and some some deep thinking uh, uh, in it and um, um, so it's it's uh, it was good to do uh, that as well and and John as a singular intellectual activist mind of that early movement um uh, and um recognized very early as an elder uh, mm -hmm. and just for me really worth remembering i've always thought well, I, I like to memorialize john and, and uh, remind people uh, anybody who ever heard him speak and he left most of his talent in the either of, of the longhouses and in, uh, speeches across the indian country and talking to to the folks you know with the folks uh, but uh, big impact. Uh, and it was a thinking that was approved by a traditional body of the Haudenosaunee at the Grand Council 
in Onondaga where the chiefs from the six nations, different nations and communities meet and under the auspices of the clan mothers at Onondaga. And so that body, a political body that has had continuity <clears throat> throughout history, um, it, it just constitutes something very special, you know, and again, no perfection anywhere, you know, and I always don't <laughs> there because I, I, I kind of rail against the new romanticism. I, I think the people need the truth, you know, always, you know, because mm -hmm. we got something really good, but, you know, let's, let's not uh, muck it up with, with, uh, with uh, things that are uh, not really clear. And, uh, and that was part of that thinking in Indian is leading to clear thinking, clearing the thinking, you know, it's, uh, it's not just guys in the streets with their uh, militancy and fighting the cops, you know, there were some times that that was necessary to sometimes just necessary to stop it. <laughs> but, uh, uh, and that's, and that's also just part of movement, you know, but uh, it, it was much more than that. It was the thinking, uh, and uh, another hero of mine, uh, John Trudell, Santi uh, Sue, uh, major aim guy, leader. He said, uh, "We we we can't beat him with violence because he invented violence. We have to outthink him." Mm -hmm. You know, and uh, they come together in that thought. You know, John and. John Mohawk and John Trudell and, and so I was part of that thinking tradition within the movement that I like to call attention to because uh, if um, the fight in the street sometimes is more romantic right but the uh, the actual the actual thinking that that can build the people from the inside you know build the mm -hmm. people inside out um, you see it you see it over time it works you know it works uh, our own community here, it's, it's, uh, uh, it's uh, exciting how uh, the, the, the consciousness is really strong and the programs and what folks are doing. Uh, so things change over a, a generation for sure. Yeah. Well, that's a, that's a great recommendation and, you know, a great framing for that. Uh, this whole idea of how that can, how a, a book can really change challenge that prevailing narrative and, and and lead to fundamental change in in broader attitudes uh kateri what about you do you have a pick on this uh idea uh, this concept yeah i am i actually kind of did the same thing as jose and i i picked a book that like challenges the prevailing narrative around like an idea so um the book I chose is a book of poetry, actually. It's called Deaf Republic. It's by Ilya Kaminsky. Um, and it's about this community who's in like kind of a, uh, just a, it's like not a real place, but they like lose the ability to hear. And through that, they speak through sign language. And I think it's this really interesting idea about like what happens to language in trauma and violence and upheaval and um, the importance of that, but then also like what happens when when traditional language is taken away. Um, it's And it's just, they're beautiful poems. So a, a, a fun, um, really interesting, take on this idea of um violence and yeah so that was my pick how about you sam well you know it's it, one of the great i mean jose mentions being the the forest gump <laughs> of the movement i i sometimes feel like forest gump myself which is some of the people i've been able to work with uh particularly in uh in native american uh culture and uh politics and history uh, over the years and we've we've done writings and and Jose mentioned several of the people we've been very blessed to uh do the books with uh, Jose of course with Taino which challenged the narrative John Mohawk's collection we did a collection by Hank Adams another one of those brains of the movement 
Um, Wilma Mankiller worked with her, uh, challenging this whole idea of uh, the role of gender uh, in indigenous cultures. And of course, uh, Vine Deloria, uh, Vine Deloria Jr., the great intellect. Um, and we did several books with Vine, uh, but I wanted to call out one of his simply because it's a book that I think is important within the indigenous movement in that it was a part of his uh, thinking later in his life, looking at the whole idea of the cosmos and, and you know, how we connect. Um, but also it's a book that really kind of was ripped from the headlines at the time. Uh, and this was a book uh, called Evolution, Creationism, and Other Modern Myths. Uh, this was a book that Vine did in the uh, early 2000s. Uh, and it was a response to the uh, battles that we saw across the country uh, on the whole idea of evolution versus creationism versus intelligent design. And Vine wanted to really reclaim that space for indigenous thinking and remind people that, you know, the, the, the indigenous peoples of the earth have a, a much greater understanding of creation than they're given credit for. And he wanted to, to kind of walk back what was happening and say, wait, there might be a whole different way to, to look at this. Uh, but one of my favorite lines in a book that I did with, with Vine was in his introduction to this book. <clears throat> he says, uh, this book sketches an outline for a new way of looking at the world. I offer no comfort to religious fundamentalists or evolutionists. The views of both are passe and represent only a quarrel within the Western belief system, not an accurate rendering of Earth history. <laughs> and so, wow, if that line doesn't kind of hit you over the head and say, you know, we're still here and we have stories to, to, to tell and uh, and correctives in place, uh, that that line was it. So that's uh, that's my recommendation. Well, Jose, uh, I want to just thank you so much because you walked us through 50 years of history, of activism, of uh, a raising of consciousness culturally, politically, uh, socially, uh, which and, and the fact that you were able to be a part of all of this is, is simply remarkable. You you really are a uh, I, I, the Forrest Gump <laughs> line is great, but. You, you are in so many ways a hero of the movement as well, that you were, played an integral role in all of this and were able to, you were able to still carry these traditions forward. So I really want to thank you uh, for joining us today and to, for your continued work as a, a truth carrier and as somebody who is out there sharing uh, the, the, the vision of the world that uh, we all need to better understand. Thank you, Sam. I really appreciate the opportunity, and thank you for being there as Fulcrum as well. You know, you guys are good. You got a good eye for what you do. Uh, Kateri or Katali, as they say here, uh, <laughs> Katali is, uh, is the first uh, native saint of the Catholic Church in the hemisphere, Katali de Gauguita. So when I heard your name, I thought, well, there's a connection there. <laughs> <laughs> Somewhere there's a connection there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, uh, be well. Yeah. Thank nice you. Time. Thank you so much, Jose.